the following podcast was recorded at the Antix Safety and Quality Conference 2014, Rapid Response Teams. John Santa Maria talks on crises and accountability, the Rapid Response Team from an ICU Director's perspective. Thank you to the organisers for asking me to, uh, to talk at the meeting. It's something that I do still enjoy at, at the hospital is our work with the medical emergency team. Um, look, my brief was to talk um, about it from a director's perspective and also to look at accountability and to look at crises. And rather than addressing them as separate issues, I thought I might sort of just weave them through, uh, through the talk. And I've divided this into sort of several phases. Um, I'll mention briefly about the merit study, but I want to look at it as the medical emergency team as a child, as an adolescent, and now as an adult and uh, show you the issues that sort of faced us in that period of time. Now back in 2002, seems a long time ago, we had a cardiac arrest team. ICU wasn't actually involved in the arrest team. It wasn't administered, the team. It uh, had all different registrars that attended and had a hospital committee that gave a bit of equipment every now and again. But then in I can't remember, 2001, 2002, we were asked to participate in the merit study, and this was a great opportunity, the one that we needed. And fortunately, we were randomised to the active arm. And with enormous amount of work, particularly from Jenny Holmes, who's around here, you've seen her, um, we implemented a MET really within a few months. And from the outset, we wanted what we called a MET service. And this is something that Ken, who's down in the front here, has spoken about over the time. It's just not a team, but it's a service around it. And you might appreciate this as we go through the talk a little bit more. So as a director, what did I have to do? Well, first of all, we had to define what calls we wanted. And we elected to continue the code blue as well as the um, MET call. Code blue was for a, a, a true cardiac arrest. The team for us was easy to define. It was going to be a medical registrar, an ICU registrar, and an ICU nurse. And the reason that we had this compromise about two calls was that we couldn't guarantee airway skills with an ICU registrar because of all the rotations that we have in. So a code blue meant that the anaesthetic team needed to come. They were very happy to have them met because most of their calls disappeared. We then also def defined who was going to do all the work of writing up, contacting parent units and doing all the audit sheets which we made uh, mandatory. Calling criteria, we didn't have to do anything there because they are all defined, but we also set up a database at that time and I think that this is a very important thing that everybody needs to do. We also established a feedback system. The first feedback system comprised chocolate frogs. You'd be surprised, you had to actually get people to make calls in those early days. And one way was to give them a chocolate frog for doing so and to thank them for doing it. Um, nowadays, uh, feedback's a bit more. We've got regular reviews and I'll show you these as we go on um, through it. And we also had to educate the hospital. We had to educate all the clinical staff. We had to talk to executives, to divisions. Uh, the wards, and we still have to talk to all new staff coming through. Some allied health staff who wanted to be part of the MET system. We tried to get support staff, but the union stepped in and they wanted money. If their staff had to call a MET, they wanted an extra amount of money per week, so we never got around to doing that. I have to say events went well. The trial was completed in the end of May of 2003 and we as a group decided we should continue the MET. But we almost stopped it because the work was getting too hard. Collecting all the data was difficult and at the grand round in October, we were going to announce it was stopping. Well, at 10 o'clock that morning, they came through with funding and we had to announce, well, the MET was going to continue. We uh, had a few pockets of resistance, surgeons saying, we know how to look after our patients, we don't want you coming, but that very rapidly disappeared. And I think part of the thing is that we ran the TPN service for the 15 years before that, and people knew us on the ward. That was how we got to see all the sick patients, 
was by doing the TPN back in those earlier days. Well, what about the adolescent MET? This sort of was over the next, uh, you know, six or seven years. The introduction of any major change takes time to impact on care. Um, and I think this is one of the things maybe with the merit study that was maybe underestimated just how long it would take an institution to change. But like a growing child, you've got to protect it and you've also got to make sure it doesn't get out of control. So what did we do? Well, the calling criteria, we did change slightly. We removed the threatened airway and we asked people in all cases of a threatened airway, call a code blue cardiac arrest because that brought along the person with the airway skills, the anaesthetic registrar. We also refined the wording around oxygenation. So if you're hypoxic, don't call us unless you've put oxygen on. You, you think people would do that, but it, you have to be explicit about it on occasions. And we also had to make some changes to the definition of altered conscious state. The team has remained the same, but I'll mention a bit more of that later on. And the database, it really has become extremely useful uh, for us. We, we even now record our opinions about all the calls so that we can provide feedback to the units and to the wards. And to show you that, what we do, you won't be able to read this, but this is a form that we send back every three months to every nurse unit manager of each of the wards, and we send it to the head of the unit. And I'm not sure if you can see it. Have I got a little pointer on here? Um, but anyway, you, you can actually see that each call is actually physically recorded. They see the patient and they see what we thought were the reasons for the call and what was actually done. So we ask people to review that. We also produce a report for the hospital. It's got a bit fancier as time goes by, and apologies to my staff for not telling them I was going to show it today. But this is a statistical report um, that actually provides information, and we then prevent present this to quality councils, senior nurse advisory councils, and to various groups throughout. And I think the analysis of this data has proven very useful. Um, we've been able to make recommendations about trends that we've actually seen. We developed a module, if you like, about oxygenation and how to look after people who are hypoxic. And most recently, we've developed a seizure protocol, a, a flow chart for how people manage seizures, because that was seen as a deficiency on the wards. In addition, we've had some papers that we've been able to publish from the database. We continue to educate staff. We, we still don't have a dedicated MET training course, which I think is a deficiency, but we have provided our trainees with a modified basic course, the one uh, that um, Charles Gomesall does, we've, we've instituted for the people coming through. Have we had any major crises during this time? And the answer is probably no. It was really just business as usual and watching it grow over a period of time. So the last few years, this is the adult sort of met. What have we done? Well, the team elements have remained the same, but we've, we've now having discussions about what seniority of the person going on the call should there be. We've never sent red residents, we've always sent registrars, but should they be the junior medical people going or should they be the dedicated ICU registrars? Our workload has been increasing, but it's been, in a way, a little easier to do the MET calls because we've had a senior registrar appointed during the day, which has freed up a registrar. And when we had some additional beds open this year, we got a second registrar at night who, whose duties are to look after the MET call as well as the, uh, the second part of the ICU. Simultaneous calls, these, these do occur, and, and they're just so, they are uncommon, but you've still got to think about how you do it. Sometimes it means the medical registrar goes to one, the ICU registrar goes to the other during the day. Even an, the intensivist may actually be the primary person going up to the calls. Um, but there are other locations. We've had car parks where you've got to get into. We've got other buildings to go to. And, and they re, uh, require some special consideration. Um, the, um, I'll talk a little bit more about the legal responsibilities uh, a little bit later. 
That's a graph showing our, in green, are the number of calls per month that we do of MET calls. And that goes all the way back to when we started that back in 2002, 2003. It was steady increase. That's the line of regression fit. And it really was getting more difficult a couple of years ago before we got the second registrar. We also found that 25% of our calls were on patients who had NFR orders. We were spending two hours a day outside the ICU and that was taking our registrar away from the ward. Um, and it became difficult so we, we had to actually make a decision in July last year and we told the wards we were not going to go to MET calls on patients with valid NFR orders. We said we'd be happy to see the patients, so give us a call if there was an issue. But we didn't think that we had to drop everything, stop doing the central line or, or break up the ward round in order to see these patients. And we also believe that the parent unit and the medical, you know, the teams on the ward, this was part of their responsibility and they really needed to get back to do it. We've been trying for some time, other units have been able to do this to get an urgent doctor call. Um, you know, the patient is now not meeting MET criteria, but we need the, the, someone from the parent team to come up and see the patient. And we just haven't been able to get the hospital engaged enough to, to get that calling system going. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to do that in the next six months. But that's a big issue and a very time-consuming one for me uh, as a director. I think feedback uh, still continues to the wards uh, where you wouldn't believe this but those reports we weren't allowed to send anywhere else it was private executive business and it was could only be seen by the senior executives of the hospital but now we've been able to distribute that report more freely at a final level we've had to do feedback to our own members of our team and I, and I like to sort of when people come to ICU I like to orient them and say when you go to the wards, at, uh, particularly at night or after hours, you're not in ICU. They don't have one-to-one -one nursing and the nurses don't have the doctor sitting up uh, at a desk nearby. The wards have one nurse to, you know, maybe eight or ten patients overnight and maybe only one of deteriorating patients that they've got. And all they've got access to is maybe a call to a doctor intern who may not know what to do. So when you go to the wards, don't get grumpy with people. And I think we've had, to, um, we've had to caution some of our registrars about this. Even when they get called to a patient who is not for resuscitation, don't get grumpy with the staff. We'll follow up later on. We do at award level have to deal with inappropriate calls. You know, should people have, you know, who have a valid NFR have a cardiac arrest call? This is still done. And uh, it's pretty uncommon now, but it still happens. Information isn't conveyed over. We've had CPR done on people who are asleep and woken up uh, uh, much to their consternation. And we've even had calls made on people who have died. Have you had that happen? As soon as you go to the ward, the person's been dead for a couple of hours, but it's only because the observations have occurred and they think maybe I better do a call. But that does require some follow up at award level and, and again, not, not, not to castigate people for making the call, but how can we do this better? Um, we have to also work with, uh, with uh, parent units. You know, there are teams that like to sit in outpatients and so oh, I know my patient's sick, I'm a bit too busy, I don't want to be in outpatients too long, so just call the Met, they'll fix it up. Or I'm in theatre and I, you know, I know I'm just having my break between cases, so let the Met team and I think this is a big challenge is for us to re-engage the parent units. We often talk about de-skilling of the wards, but I'm not sure it's a de-skilling. I think it's a disengagement. They just know someone else will do it and they're quite happy to let it happen. Um, for many of you used to hear Michael Buse talk about it, that MET is a band-aid. It's something we've put in place to help at this stage it is not a final solution. I think there is a big imperative for data collection. I'll talk about this a bit later on again, but like the ANZICS APD, we do need a rich MET database to which everybody can contribute. 
we not only need to know about why calls are made, such as the hypotension, hypoxia, altered conscious state and so forth, but we also need to know the reasons behind it. I, I call these the MET syndromes, and you would have seen Daryl's paper from a few years ago, that we need to define these things. Because with this information, we're going to be able to do better teaching. We have to get better at education with the knowledge behind the calls. This will make the task a bit easier of what we actually teach people. Not only will it assist in training of the teams, but we can take examples to the wards. And our liaison nurses now run deteriorating patient work days, which are heavily subscribed by the wards, where they go through the different scenarios that we've actually been able to define from the database. We've also, another example, we've, we've found that tachycardia is a common calling criterion. And many of these are due to new onset atrial fibrillation. But do you think there's a standard way of treating AF on the ward? And the number of times you end up seeing AF and hypotension because an inappropriate drug has been given, we feel that we can do this better by defining a protocol or a suggestion, a pathway that could be done. Another issue that we've found, uh, you've probably found this too, with people coming back from theatre and about five or six hours later, it's an altered conscious state, partly because their CO2 is probably 60 from all the long-acting endone, oxycontin, and the patch that wasn't removed when they went to theatre and then they were given some more narcotic. This is the information that you can get from the databases. And we'll talk a little bit later, I think, that, but simulation is going to be a way forward in, in doing this. And I think audit and research are going to have to continue as we refine what we do. And I think Australia is, uh, has a long and impressive role in this area. Well, what about crises and things that have happened? Well, I, I mentioned about the multiple calls. These will always happen, and you just have to do the best you can. External situations, I, th I still think cardiac arrests in car parks, and we've got three car parks around us, are awful. But again, you know, it's something you've just got to walk through, you know, work through. What about legal and things? Um, I mentioned before that we're looking at about accountability within the hospital. As I said, our ICU registrars are not always the people that have airway skills, as we have rotations from medicine and from emergency as well as from anaesthesia, and some of them people can be very junior. I still think that the final responsibility for care of the patient in the hospital is the parent unit. But having said that, if we go up and do things, we have to be responsible for what we do. So we shouldn't extend ourselves. You know, if the medical registrar decides not to call the anaesthetic registrar and intubate the patient and it's an esophageal intubation and the person dies, well, that person is still responsible for trying it. Um, I do think that anaesthesia is probably the, the group that has to assume responsibility for airway skills in the hospital. And probably ICU has a role as, as the deteriorating patient reference point within the hospital. Part of this is we're going to be the ones who uh, are going to get a significant number of patients and we need to sort of help. We do need to know about uh, the standards and how we're going to implement them. We had our first patient-initiated MET call the other day, which was interesting. We have to look at other ways of getting data in for monitoring. It shouldn't be just observations of patients, but good work going on at the Austin about listening to pathology tests going around the hospital and uh, making uh, alerts when they are abnormal. And we're going to get more into bedside monitoring, and you'll see Philips and Massimo outside there with their various devices that are going to provide some feedback. Finally, this is a little slide that I tend to use every now and again in different situations. And I wish I had a pointer to actually... No. No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Can someone put my slide back on again? Um, if you look at the first sort of line, a person comes in hospital, that's the white line. They're going all right, and then bang, something happens. It can be very quick. And that's what we always assumed, that that first line going down to death and cardiac arrest 
was the way deterioration occurred. But work through the 80s and the 90s and that showed that deterioration actually could progress at a slower rate and then a person had a cardiac arrest. And I think the important thing to remember is that if you have a cardiac arrest, certainly in our hospital, the mortality is 50%. If you have a MET call, it's 25%. So what the Met did was hopefully stop that progression down to arrest and death and got the person back on the trajectory. But if we could get units engaged to keep looking at their patients, um, there are surgical teams who don't even go and see their patients now after surgery before they go home. They need to be more involved and maybe they can stop the deterioration and put that yellow line back towards optimal care. And finally, we probably have to think about how can we detect people who are at risk of deterioration when they immediately get to hospital. That 80-year-old with severe cardiac failure under the surgical unit that no medical team has ever seen needs to be identified as soon as they hit hospital. And there are ways in which we're looking around that. So in summary, I think we can do better. And I think that um, as a, you know, this is where we as a group I'm not specifically saying it's the director of ICU, but I think there is a group, somebody within each hospital that has to take this responsibility and run with it. We're going to be looking after the deteriorating patients from now and into the future. So thank you very much. For more podcasts from Antics, go to antics.com.au. Thank you.